Carrie Gracie was a top editor at the BBC. She worked there for 30 years, and about five years ago, she moved to China for a prestigious job as one of four international editors. Then, last summer, she found out she made 50% less than the men doing the same job. She resigned. I was, for four years, leading our China coverage. That's Carrie testifying in front of British Parliament a few months ago. There are significant risks in our China coverage. I dealt with them. I did a good job. Twice I've been a Royal Television Society nominee for the BBC for Specialist Journalist of the Year. It's just... And, and you know, what, I'm, I'm getting emotional. But what I really want to say about this equal pay problem at the BBC is what it forces the BBC to do is to retrofit in defense, you know, defenses, justifications of the indefensible. The BBC gets most of its funding from the public. Its newest charter required the broadcaster to reveal how much it pays its top talent. The government thought the people should know where their money was going. It turned out it was mostly going to men. The BBC had a wide pay gap at its most senior levels. The top man made over two million pounds. The highest paid woman, just a quarter of that. You have an equal pay problem, but you can't admit it because you don't want to confront what may be fiscal liabilities, which we all agree are there. The BBC's pay scandal and Kerry's public statements caused a big headache for the company. The broadcaster has faced almost 200 equal pay complaints and a flood of negative press. The BBC told Bloomberg in a statement, We are committed to making the BBC the best place for women to work and have said we want to close the gender pay gap and have women in half of leadership and on-air roles by 2020. When individual issues over pay have been raised, we have sought to resolve them as quickly as possible. But Carrie wants more from the BBC. My problem will be resolved by an acknowledgement that my work was of equal value to the men who I served alongside as an international editor. Carrie's story doesn't sound that different than the ones we've been telling you about in the U.S. But there is one big difference between here and there. The British government isn't just requiring the BBC to fess up about pay. It's requiring all of its biggest businesses to report their gender pay gaps. Companies don't have to get as specific as the BBC did. Remember, the BBC is funded by British taxpayers, so that's why it had to disclose. But as part of a new law that went into effect this year, all large companies in the UK have to report to the government what they pay men versus women. And Carrie's story was kind of a prelude to the reckoning the entire country is going through now. When you look at the world, you know, we're 50% of the population. Like, where is our place? Like, where is our value? Women deserve equal pay for equal work. The gender line helps to keep women not on a pedestal, but in a cage. You don't feel it, but when you see the numbers, it's shocking. Girl power, equalization between the sexes. Women, what do they want? We want to end gender inequality, and to do this, we need everyone involved. Without women's work, the wheel of the country, they did not turn. You always ask who's the best person, and it's always a white bloke. There's got to be something wrong. And here are the all-male nominees. Welcome back to The Paycheck. I'm Rebecca Greenfield. The pay gap isn't just a phenomenon in the U.S. Globally, women make about half of what men do, and that's average earnings according to the World Economic Forum. The UK looks a lot like the US. There are some equal pay laws on the books, but on average, women make a little under 20% less than men. But unlike the US, the UK is trying to fix things on a national scale. The country is in the middle of a big nationwide experiment. As of April this year, Every large company in the UK had to publicly report its gender pay gap. That is the raw, unadjusted difference between what all the men and all the women make in a given company. It's a shaming initiative. Companies who have particularly big gaps, and a lot of them do, will be theoretically incentivized to close them. So far, over 10,000 companies have reported, 
And what they've reported in most cases is that men are making more than women. Goldman Sachs, remember the company from episode one that's fighting a class action gender discrimination suit here in the U.S.? Its female U.K. employees make less than half of what the men do. Over at Bloomberg.com, there's a graphic that compiled all the company pay gaps, including ours. These numbers aren't broken down by job title or level of experience. So they don't tell us anything about what men and women are being paid for the same jobs. What these numbers show is that at most companies, women hold very few of the highest paid positions. The question is, what happens next? Susie Ring, a reporter in Bloomberg's London Bureau, reports. Now that gender pay reporting is the law in England, every single UK company with 250 employees or more has had to report their gender pay gap. They had a deadline of April 2018 to do it, and the figure they were asked for was simple. No fancy math needed. Just, what on average do the men make at your company versus what the women make? If the men make a lot more, it likely means yours is a company where men are mostly at the senior levels with the best paid jobs and women have a lot of the more junior roles. I can remember it being very male top heavy. So I remember attending events and the the men at the front were exactly that, they were men. Um... And I remember looking at those people and thinking, will I ever be standing on that stage with those men? Or actually, is it, is it a man's job? Is it a middle-aged man, man's job? White male job, actually? This is Sarah Farquhar-Hassam. She's 32 and has been working in customer service since she was 17. She says that through her years in the industry, she's noticed something about her colleagues. They're mostly women. And the people in the most senior ranks? Mostly men. Sarah now works for Virgin Money, the financial services business of Richard Branson's sprawling Virgin Empire. She works at the company's customer service centre in the northern English city of Newcastle. It's her job to check on how well other customer service agents are answering customer complaints. She's also paid less than most people at her company. Customer service workers are among the lowest paid groups at Virgin Money, and most of the customer service workers are women. That's why, even though Virgin Money has a female CEO, and it openly celebrated this new gender pay reporting law and wants to be at the forefront of women's equality, the company ended up reporting a 32% gender pay gap. Here's their CEO, Jane Angardia. The reason that we um, report a gender pay gap of 32% is that although I'm, you know, I, we have a female chair, I'm a female CEO, and we've got 50% female representation on our exco, at our next senior levels of management, we are about 80 20 male. And our customer services, brilliant staff, are predominantly female. And so when you add up everybody's salaries and divide the male and the female salary, then you get the 32% pay gap. And that's why I still think numbers are important because. Our objective is to get to 50-50 throughout the organisation, and that means recruiting more brilliant men to be fabulous customer service agents and recruiting more brilliant women to be, you know, uh, in all um, layers, if you like, of the hierarchy at management. And at that point, our gender pay gap will be equal. When I say Virgin Money wanted to be out front in the fight for women, here's an example. They reported gender pay figures a year before they legally had to, revealing their pay gap for 2016. Back then, the number was even bigger, 36%. So here was Virgin Money, trying to do the right thing and be transparent about their numbers before they technically had to, and their numbers have not been making them look good, and women weren't moving up into the higher ranks from customer service roles. The customer service segment accounted for about half its gender pay gap. Here's why Sarah, the customer service worker at Virgin Money, thinks things ended up that way. I think customer service has has historically been a a female thing. Um, So you've probably got 30 to 40 to 50 years worth of female experience in that area. We work all sorts of shift patterns at Virgin um, and, and I mean that might lend, that actually might lend itself 
to women more because historically, and we have got a, we culturally have more of an issue where th there is still a view that the woman is the caregiver. Um, so if a, if a man returns to work full time and a woman needs to fit her hours around that, she will go for a business who offers flexible working. Jane Angardia says getting their gender pay gap from 36% down to 32% is a start. But she acknowledges they've got a lot of work to do. I remember going to a number of organisations and broadly 40-year-old white men saying to me, well, you're trying to take my job and my son's job away from me. And the, the point is that we have to give ourselves time to make progress because we're not in the business of firing men. <laughs> it's about making sure that every time there's a new job advertised, we've got diverse job lists to choose from. It's about making sure that in the organisation, people understand that um, yeah, everybody's filled with unconscious bias. Virgin Money is working on changes that will get more men into customer service jobs and more women into executive positions. The bank offers flexible hours across the company and looks at job applications blind to try and reduce the chances of gender bias. But a big part of their work, maybe even bigger than getting more women into executive roles, is going to be getting more men into customer service jobs. Now, I think that's really important because it means that you have to change some attitudes of men. You know, sometimes men think, I don't want to go into a customer services job, you know, I want to go into a different role. Um, but actually, that's the way I think that in financial services organisations, men and women can make a lifetime career that's going to be successful, it's going to be full of integrity, and it's going to mean that they can grow to be um, whatever they want in, uh, in the businesses of the future. What Virgin Money is going through, this very public realisation that they've put more men at the top and more women at the bottom of their company, that's happening to a lot of companies in the UK. Forced to open up their pay gap numbers, thousands of businesses are facing an uncomfortable truth and they have to figure out how to explain these numbers to the whole country. Some companies tried to massage the data to make their numbers look a little bit better. Earlier this year, it came out that some accountancy firms and law firms didn't include partners in the numbers, the highest paid tiers in their firms. What they were doing was legal. The government had said it was OK to report this way. But when people found out businesses were leaving partners out of the equation, their outrage forced a number of companies to restate their figures. Then there are the companies that didn't report in time for the deadline, even though they had to by law. About 1,500 businesses missed the April cutoff. In theory, a company can face an unlimited fine for not reporting. But we don't yet know how easy this will be to enforce and how much companies who don't comply will really have to cough up. But for most companies, what the reporting did was to force them to look closely at how their businesses were structured and why women often seem to drift to the bottom of that structure. I mean, one classic thing was Ryanair, where there's a 70% pay gap. And they were saying, well, it's obvious we've got a 70% pay gap because all the men are pilots and all the women are serving the drinks. But they've got a global pilot shortage. Why don't they train some more women as pilots? That was Harriet Harman. She's a British politician, and she's also the reason this big new law exists. Ryanair, the company she was just talking about, says that they've seen an increase in applications from female pilots and are, quote, committed to developing this welcome trend. Harriet is not surprised by the big gaps some companies are reporting. Her 36-year-long political career has been a lesson in how the different roles are for men and women in every industry, including government. When she was elected as a Member of Parliament in 1982, only 3% of British politicians were women. It seemed like women were blocked from lots of areas of British politics. Harriet was like a one-woman wrecking crew, breaking through those blockades one by one. She was the first UK female Solicitor General. For American listeners, that's basically the equivalent of the Deputy Attorney General. And also the First Minister for Women, a role that had never existed before her. It was her job to make policy about issues like women's rights. One of her crusades has been gender pay transparency. But to a lot of politicians, this idea of forcing companies to state their pay gaps, it was just too radical. 
I was a bit on my own arguing for transparency, for pay transparency, but I felt it would put the power in women's hands if they could actually see what was going on, if the veil of discrimination was torn off. Because what had been happening for years is the National Statistical Office would be reporting the overall figure of the pay gap And every organisation, they go, oh, tut, tut, isn't that awful? A pay gap. We're so against that. Must be happening somewhere else. We'd never have it here. But of course, it always was happening here. Harriet realised that without widespread support, the only way she'd ever get the law through was to go step by tiny step. The first step was to introduce an imperfect solution. Make the programme voluntary. Companies could make their pay figures public if they chose. Even getting government to do that, create a system for companies to report their pay gap if they wanted to, was controversial. We had such a fight down to the wire, it was the very last piece of legislation that got through before the general election, which we then lost. But I didn't manage to get the bill through until the literally the last day in 2010. Companies did not jump to publish their pay figures. Because the reporting was voluntary, Every business worried about sticking their neck out if they didn't have to. So by 2015, five years after the voluntary solution was put into place, only five companies in the whole country had reported their numbers. Clearly, making reporting optional wasn't working. But politicians couldn't agree on making reporting mandatory either. Vince Cable a 75-year-old British political icon and leader of the Liberal Democrats' party, was business secretary by this time. He says his political opponents were really resistant to forcing companies to report. Here he is, describing how they put it. The arguments used is, well, what is it going to tell us? Because men and women are doing different jobs. It isn't measuring um, like for like. But, but of course, as we know, that raises the basic question about why, why are men and women doing different roles? In the end, it wasn't even Harriet or Harriet's party who made the reporting mandatory. A coalition government had taken power after Harriet's party, Labour, was voted out. And basically what happened was that the left-wing party of that coalition pressured the right-wing to make a campaign promise when it was trying to get re-elected. When they were re-elected, it was the right-wing Conservative Party who had to make good on their promise and ended up forcing companies to reveal their gender pay gaps. And that's where the UK is now. It took years for a mostly male government to decide that companies should even be asked to state what men and women make. And even now that the numbers are out there, we're still seeing companies try to make their numbers better without paying women more, or fail to report, or not adequately explain why women end up in the low-paid jobs and men in the high-paid ones. Given how long it's taken us to get to this point, I asked Harriet how long she thinks it should take the country to close its gender pay gap. These are things that management can change if they want to, and therefore I think that women have waited long enough and endured unequal pay long enough. If you try and add together all the cost that women have borne by unequal pay, it is untold billions. So I would say sooner rather than later, I think women are fed up with waiting for equality. We don't know yet how much this law will affect the pay gap in the UK. Its main purpose is to diagnose a problem. It's up to companies to look at their numbers and decide what, if anything, they're going to do. But in another European country, there's a new law that's getting a lot of attention. It compels companies to do something about the pay gap. Iceland, like the US and the UK, passed equal pay and anti-discrimination laws decades ago. The anti-discrimination law has been strengthened four times since 1976. And the country has also passed laws requiring an equal number of men and women on company boards. But despite all of this, Iceland still has a pay gap of about 16%. So this year, it doubled down. While the UK has been looking at the average pay difference between men and women, Iceland has passed a new law focused on men and women who hold the same job. Claire Suddeth reports. Starting this year, Companies with more than 25 employees have to submit to the government official salaries for every job. 
And if one employee is making more than another who's doing his or her exact same job, a company has to justify that discrepancy in writing. My name is uh, Rosa Erlingsdóttir. Maybe because of those uh, long surnames, we, we use given names in Iceland. So you can call me Rosa. But I'm uh, the head of uh, the Equality Unit at the Ministry of Welfare in, in Iceland. Rosa is in charge of this big new salary law and the experiment the country ran to see if it would even work. In 2008, Iceland launched a pilot version of the law with real businesses to see what worked and what didn't. One of the businesses that participated was Iceland's customs office, where men tended to be in field jobs and women worked in the office. Those field jobs, they paid better. So custom officers working out in the field, for example, are in 98% of the cases male. And they had had the uh, unwritten rule that those men could return to the headquarters when they were close to their retirement age and just do ordinary office work. But then they were sitting and sharing offices with women that were working as secretaries. And the equal pay standard uh, is based on the, the rule of paying equally for jobs of equal value. So employers need to ask those questions. What are we paying for? You know, what value has this job for the company? Here were men working alongside women doing the same jobs, and because of their field job salary histories, the men were getting paid more. Under this new law, the customs office had to explain that to the government. And Iceland decided that if the only reason you're paying one employee more than another is that he's an older man close to retirement, well, that's not a good enough reason. The customs office volunteered to be part of this experiment. They didn't necessarily think they'd find much of a pay discrepancy. Rosa says that a lot of companies were in this boat. But many employers said that at the beginning. We are not discriminating in our company. But in many cases, they found out that their workplaces were just as gender biased as any other. And that they were, in some cases, discriminating against uh, individuals. They didn't know. And I I don't think that uh, people decide that they are going to discriminate against people or that they are going to pay this guy or this woman more or less than the colleagues. It's something that happens. When companies discover a pay gap like this, they're required to fix it. They can give people raises or even make pay cuts, but essentially they have to bring people in line with the stated salary for their job. To be clear, this new law is just one small part of Iceland's pay gap strategy. In fact, Rosa isn't really sure why Iceland's getting so much press for it. We are getting a lot of attention uh, for the work we are doing. It's it's unbelievable, you know, because I've been around since in you know, in this field since twenty years or for twenty years, and I mean we have never had this attention for the policy field. Here's something incredible about Iceland: in any given year, between forty and fifty percent of Parliament is women. The reason Iceland has been able to tackle this issue is that women have enough power to be able to make the changes they want. In fact, this whole focus on workplace equality got started because in 1975, a whopping 90 percent of the country's women went on strike, from their jobs, from childcare and chores at home, to protest their mistreatment. In 1980, Iceland was the first country in the whole world to democratically elect a woman as head of state. All those women have helped get these laws passed. Even with all these changes, closing Iceland's gap is taking an awfully long time. They still have that 16% pay gap. And once you account for the differences in the types of jobs men and women hold or hours worked, 6% of that gap still persists. A decade ago, it was 8%. But at this rate, 
it's going to take another 30 years to get it down to zero. Politicians have learned from experience that gender equality doesn't come about on its own accord. Uh, they need to push things. And, uh, and they have also learned that if they will wait until no one opposes legislative changes, they can wait forever. The fact that even in Iceland, where so many laws are already on the books to narrow the pay gap, where so many women are making the laws, there's still a 16% gap, shows you just how hard it is to get to true equality. Iceland wants to eliminate its pay gap within the next five years, but that gap is the result of generations of traditions and habits and beliefs that we've held about women and men's place in society. That's something that can't just be fixed with a few raises. Iceland has a magic ingredient to getting laws passed. A lot of women lawmakers. The United States isn't tackling the pay gap on the same national scale as Iceland and other countries, but that could change. A record number of women in the U.S. declared they were running for office in 2018. If those women win, who knows? They might look to Iceland for inspiration. But that's a lot of ifs. For now, most of the effort to close the pay gap here isn't happening on the federal level. Next week, we'll find out what happens when it's up to companies and not the government to fix pay inequality. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Paycheck. If you like the show, please head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to rate, review, and subscribe. The show was reported by Susie Ring, Claire Suddeth, and hosted and reported by me, Rebecca Greenfield. It was edited by Francesca Levy and produced by Magnus Henriksen. We also had help from Jillian Goodman, Janet Paskin, and Liz Smith. Our original music is by Leo Sidron. Carrie Vander Yacht did the illustrations on our show page, which you can find at bloomberg.com slash thepaycheck. Francesca Levy is head of Bloomberg Podcasts.